You may be seated. Good morning. I'm going to try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful, wonderful to hear people. I want to thank Reverend Diana and Reverend Richard for the opportunity to speak here again today. I am an MCC pastor or preacher. Who is MCC? Metropolitan Community Churches. It's a denomination that was founded one year before Stonewall by Reverend Troy Perry, a Pentecostal minister who was defrocked for being gay, or rather for admitting that he was gay. It was the first denomination founded by and for the LGBTIQ plus communities long before there were so many wonderful letters and the first gay and lesbian organization in the nation to own property. And it was a church. <laughs> for goodness sake, Troy said this of the early MCC church, quote, we had very little trouble with doctrine. We never made it an issue. There were important things upon which we all agreed. Love your God, stand tall, walk proud, and love your neighbor as yourself, end quote. Which is what you did at the Pride Parade yesterday. <laughs> amen, love your God, stand tall, walk proud, love your neighbor as yourself. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 Bless you all for that and your presence there. Now to me it's very fitting that Pride Sunday rocks up against Trinity Sunday this year. I think, I think Trinity Sunday is the queerest Sunday in the lectionary cycle. <laughs> it deals with a doctrine rather than an actual event in the Bible and when it comes right down to it, the Trinity is something not specifically mentioned in the Bible. However, it is there by inference. All the pieces are there, and we just have to put them together as one. Now, for me, the Trinity is about relationship. It's about diversity. It's about flow. And it's also about possibility. Our God is a God of possibility. Indeed, with God, all things are possible. And that's what I want to share with you today. Possibilities. Sometimes in the midst of doctrines, it's easy to feel that we are being told what to believe. And sometimes we are. Yet I think that when we consider possibilities, we step beyond that. Our world becomes larger. Our life becomes larger and more abundant. And our God becomes so much bigger. Even pride parades get bigger and much more diverse. And that's what I hope to do today, to share some possibilities, a different way of looking at things. Just as a prism refracts light into a rainbow of colors, so many possibilities, yet all are a part of the same light, the same illumination, so I want to offer a bit of what the light looks like through my prism. You see, when different people begin to look at the Bible or the gospel, they see different things. When women began to open the scriptures, they found miracle of miracle stories of women. Stories about women. Even just a few words here and there, even when the stories unfolded between the lines, even when not directly mentioned but inferred, in the text, women knew they were there. The God story became a story of women too. It is indeed the same when queer folk begin to explore the scriptures. We begin to find queer things, really queer things. We begin to find ourselves there, even when others do not see us. The Bible becomes so much bigger for us, God so much bigger. I've often said, for example, it is right there in the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, 27. God said, let us create humanity in our image. Male and female, let us create them. And so, if both male and female are created in the image of God, then God is similar to both, but unlike either similar to both, but unlike either. And that is the very definition of genderqueer. 
gender fluid, gender non-binary. Not one or the other, neither either or, yet encompassing every and all in between. If we always and consistently use male pronouns for God, for divinity, then we have misgendered the deity. We have gone with limitations instead of possibilities. So right in the beginning of creation, we are given a very big canvas on which to view divinity. Why work with a small one? Why be either or, which is the very definition of a binary system, when there is so much more? Throughout the Bible, God is compared to a king, a warrior, a pregnant woman giving birth, a woman nursing her child, a mother hen, a mama bear. This becomes even more apparent to me when we look at the Trinity, with divinity being non-binary, similar to both, but unlike either, far beyond the concepts of what we may even think of as gender. And then Jesus being male-bodied, yet very much a gender transgressor, transgressing, crossing the gender norms for the time in which he lived. And the spirit most often referred to in feminine terms, even going back to the beginning. The Hebrew word for spirit, ruach, is feminine. So, in the Trinity, we have this kind of fluid dance, this gender fluid dance, which is beautiful, and in this sense, it makes sense to me to even use the word they, them, has pronouns for the deity. Then I hear, oh no, you can't use they, them for a single entity. That's bad grammar. No, no, it isn't. We do it all the time, and we do it without even thinking about it. We do it all the time when we don't know the gender of the one we are speaking about. For example, oh, look, a person has left their Bible here, their Bible. I'm sorry for them. I hope they will come back and get it. If God is beyond genders and the Trinity is a balance of genders, then using they, them does totally work. I try to be as fluid about our Creator and not use one or see one way all the time. Because I will tell you, exclusivity is the opposite of possibility. Exclusivity is the opposite of possibility. Ultimately, the Bible comes down to us as a tumble of words through a number of different languages and translations from assorted times and cultures and peoples. It's a miracle that we can sort things out sometimes. But language is all that we've got. And yet at the same time, we must remember that language is limiting. And divinity is far older than our words and attempts to describe. Older than the beginning of the earth. Older than the fire. Older than the spark that starts the fire and yet as new and as fresh and as young as the flame that burns on our altar. And on the altar of our hearts. For goodness sake, we worship a God who self-identifies as I am. OMG, how beautiful is that? <laughs> our God is more yes and than either or. And in my best moments, I shed all my labels and all my pronouns and the things that either make me a part of or keep me apart from others, and I simply identify as I am. I am. I am made in the image of the Creator, the great maker, the most high, the holy one. I am covered in the Creator's fingerprints. And so for me, the concept of the Trinity is only a part, it's a possibility, one of a whole constellation of possibilities and genders. And for me, those who persecute and try to limit the varied human expression of genders are doing a disservice to creation and the Creator. To such, I say, if you have social objections to my community, 
If we make you uncomfortable, then have those feelings. Certainly. But do not use the Bible and do not use God to justify your hate or your discomfort. It doesn't work that way. To do so does harm, sometimes irreparable harm, beyond the capacity of human healers. For goodness sake, I have a non-binary friend who will never cross the threshold of any church. Never consider any church has an option or even anything to explore. Not even my church. Not a possibility. Because of the hatred that has been stoked by bad religion. And whenever I try to bring it up to them, whenever I try to talk about God to them, they will simply say and tell me, no, they are mommy's little abomination. And that, that to me is the real sin. That's the real sin. Breaking the relationship between someone and divinity. Trying to come in between that relationship. Of course I keep trying to reach my friend. Nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. Can I get an amen? amen. However, I will tell you this. People can indeed separate us from our ability to connect with divinity. Our ability to see God, to love God. And that's where the sin is to me. That's where that broken relationship is. I want to close with one of my favorite stories. You may have heard me tell it before. I'm going to tell it again because I want to hear it once more myself. <laughs> you can find it in a few verses in Mark 14, 12 to 16, and Luke 22, 7 to 13. But I'm going to tell it to you as I read it, as I understand it, as I infer that event unfolding. So here it is. Jesus and the disciples are headed into Jerusalem during the Passover. The streets are crowded. They're full of people, packed. The disciples ask, where are they going to have the Passover meal? And they discover there is no reservation made. They ask Jesus, I mean, come on, Jesus, you lead us all the way here into this big city, crowded with Passover happening, big holiday, folks from all over, everyone trying to find a place to have their Passover meal, and you expect us to find a place last minute? That's like trying to find a hotel in a college town during graduation. It's impossible. Jesus said, you go into the city, you will encounter a man carrying water. Follow him to where he goes. Ask the owner, where is the guest room where the rabbi may have the Passover meal with his disciples? They do as Jesus said. They find the place and a room ready and eager to receive him. Now on the surface, that sounds strange, impossible, and maybe even a little magical, you know? Yet think about it, in that day and age, men did not carry domestic water. There really are no parallels in the scriptures. Carrying water for a living space was woman's work. And so, to encounter a man carrying water for a domicile was very unusual. <coughs> it would stand out. And it would also likely mean what? That he was part of a household that did not have any women. Hmm, what could that mean? I know households like that. It might mean that such a place also might not be popular with the vast majority of conservative Jews. And like most things, Jesus didn't care what they thought, but he would be aware, and thus he would know that very likely such a place would have an available room on a short notice. Now that would be kind of like going to a gay bed and breakfast in a town during a conservative religious convention. <laughs> You're likely to find a room there. 
In this light, all of the words of Jesus in those small verses make perfect sense to me. And I tell you, it's certainly a possibility. And one that leaves me with a bigger Jesus. One that leaves me with a bigger image of God. And that is what querying the Bible means. That is what querying the Bible means. But no matter, I will tell you this, at the very least, a sacrament that all Christians share in various ways, our celebration of Holy Communion began and has its roots in an act of gender transgression. A location determined by following a person transgressing the gender norms for their time. And so on this Pride Sunday and this Trinity Sunday, hopefully I have left you with many possibilities to consider. And maybe, just maybe, a glimpse of a bigger Jesus, a bigger divinity, and a bigger trinity. So I hope it may be. Hallelujah, glory be, and amen.